Welcome to LifeSpring Church's YouTube channel. We hope you enjoy Sunday's message. To find out more about us, please head to www.lifespringchurch.org.uk. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. And um, thanks, John, for and guys, just for leading us in worship. Why don't we just stand a moment and uh, just say hi to someone that you've not spoken to this morning, or particularly if there's somebody around you that you don't know, just welcome them. Um, so let's just have a little bit of a fellowship. Give a hug, give a handshake. A holy kiss. Welcome guys in the circle. Okay, okay. let's take our seats and uh, just, just put your hand up if you've not been greeted or spoken to. Anybody not been greeted or spoken to? Good, as long as everybody knows that they're welcome in this place, that's good. Right, so we're going to look this morning at the theme which we were looking at before the summer break, August Sunday is a little bit different, back to the start. Um, the next week we've got baptisms and then we'll be picking things up again um, later on. So, um, so you know, many have been away, so welcome back if you've been away on holiday and um, hope you've been enjoying the nice weather that we've been having. Um, but there's still people away, so we're still in this process of starting term again. But I just wanted to come back to the theme that we felt challenged by the Lord for just early on this year, back to the start and I've entitled it Loving God, Loving People. It's a phrase that we sometimes use in describing the vision of our church. You see, love is at the heart of the gospel. God so loved the world, he sent Jesus. Faith without love, it's not true Christian faith. Love needs to be our motivation. Love for God and love for each other. And when love is missing, regardless of what we're doing, the heart of God is missing. Would you agree? God is love. He doesn't just love, he is love. And when he's with us and when he's being expressed through our hearts, then the love of God touches other lives too. In Paul's letter to the Corinthians, he tells them that they could do all sorts of stuff. They could speak in tongues, they could feed the poor, they could even become a martyr. But if love was missing, if love wasn't the motivation, it's a waste of time. They're harsh words. Because lots of people think that by doing good and by making sacrifice, they're pleasing God or pleasing people. But Paul says, but if the love of God's not in your heart, you're just wasting your time. So we could say today, you can speak in tongues, you can heal the sick even, you could lead a life group or the children's work, serve at the rock festival but we just need to check our motivation too because actually it's not only a waste of time but people can see through it if love isn't the motivation if we're just doing it because of guilt or pressure and there's no love we're missing the mark so our challenge today in all that we do let love be our motivation whether it's feeding the hungry, whether it's leading a life group, leading worship, reaching the lost with the gospel, let love be at our heart. So I want to, oh, Kim, sorry, I haven't put my timer on. So, so I want to look at a, a, a few scriptures. Firstly, one that we looked at a little while back, three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest is love. So Paul tells us faith, hope, and love, they're going to remain. And we looked at this a little while back, um, but this trilogy needs to be the foundation of our hearts. And as I was meditating and 
thinking about what I wanted to share, it came to me, you know, we're actually called to be a community of faith, a community of hope, and a community of love. That's powerful. That's powerful. When people touch, touch that community, their lives are going to be changed. And I believe that's what God wants to put in our hearts. All these attributes, they're so attractive, especially in a world where there is little faith and faithfulness, where hope is being lost in the nation. And many individuals feel life has just overtaken them. They're hopeless, they're out of control. And certainly many don't feel loved, often forgotten, lonely, or judged. But God has an answer. It's the Church of Jesus Christ, the community of faith, hope, and love. And I think it's so important we don't just keep this community to ourselves. But as we raise that level of faith and that hope and expectation and love in our hearts and lives, we need to let that spill out to those who don't yet know him. We're going to see in the next few verses a real test and expression of our love for God is our love for each other. So here we are from Revelation, another verse we looked at recently. But I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Look how far you've fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. Some translations don't have or each other in the text. But quite a number of translations do include that little phrase too. And that's a challenge which I want to bring us. Jesus is saying to this church in Ephesus, this is a complaint that he has, you don't love me or each other as you used to do. So how do we show our love for God? Sure, in our sung praise, an overflow of worship and gratitude, but also in our obedience to the word of God. Do you remember the prophet Samuel? Saul thought he was obeying God. Saul thought he was, he was going to have a, an amazing sacrifice and he evidently kept all the sheep and the cattle which he just plundered from, from the enemies to offer as a sacrifice. But the word to Saul was destroy everything. And he ignored that word and thought he would just have a worship service. And the prophet comes to him and said, obedience is more important than worship. Obedience is more important than sacrifice. That's a challenge to all of us, isn't it? As we seek to follow and to obey. Because what we do on Sunday or whenever else needs to come out of a heart which is following him. John reminds us, the Apostle John, we can't say we love God, but not our brother or sister. And that's why in my book, you can't say, oh, I love God, but not the church. Too many Christians take that view. It doesn't add up. Or, and I used to find this as a street pastor, people would come and say to me when they found out what we were doing, well, I'm a Christian, but, but you don't have to go to church, do you, to be a Christian? They're just completely missing the point. They are church if they're saved. And if they're saved, they'll want to gather. They'll want to meet. They'll want to fellowship because we are the family of God. And if that love and that heart isn't within us, I would say we need to ask that question, are we really saved? Are we really children of God if we don't want to meet with our father and we don't want to meet with our brothers and sisters? That's the good news of the gospel. When we become saved, he becomes our father. And church becomes our family. And families in general, even though there's ups and downs and the squabbles, in general they enjoy getting together. And they're loyal and they're supportive and they're caring. And that's how we need to be as the Church of Jesus Christ too. A few weeks ago we were on holiday in France and uh, most of our extended family were able to come. So we had grandparents and we had parents and children and grandchildren. Loads of us. And we loved it. And then on top of that some from our spiritual family joined us too. Some of our friends from here. And they added to the experience and people come to me and say, don't you get tired of church? You know, you even do church on holiday. But for us, it was family. It wasn't like hardship. It was a blessing. And others coming added blessing to our holiday. We're family together. Do you understand? And that's how we should be with each other. 
And so love for God and each other. I feel it needs to be rediscovered. So we're proactive and we're intentional in the way we express it. And as we do, we become and express that community of love we're called to be. So let's do as Jesus commands. Let's look for ways to love God and each other as we did when we first, when he first came into our lives. Another verse, 1 John. We love, some translations just leave it like this, we love because he first loved us first, because he loved us first. But others add, we love him or we love each other because he loved us first. And I'm not a Greek scholar, so I don't know who's right and who's wrong, but the gist, I believe, is the heart of God. We love God because he first loved us. We love each other because he first loved us. You see, it's important that we've received, had revelation of his love. God took the initiative and God showed us his unconditional love by sending his son to die for us. And unless we've received that revelation and that understanding or at least grasp something of it in our hearts, we're not going to be able to love God as well as we should, and we're not going to be able to love each other as well as we should either. Paul tells us this, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, while we were away from God, while we were enemies of Christ, he died for us. And then 1 John again he tells us this, this is how we know what love is, Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. So as we begin to grasp his love, which goes on, sometimes sing about it, and on and on and on. And as we begin to realize he's always for us, and as we begin to understand this amazing, outrageous grace and forgiveness which is poured out upon us, then we too can begin to love God back. And we can begin to love each other through the power of the Holy Spirit because his love so undeservedly has touched our hearts too. And so we want to let that go and release that to others. When we've been touched by his love, we love God with a whole heart. Worship is natural. It's not forced. It's not something we have to go to or do. It's from the heart. Before I received the Holy Spirit, worship was boring, it was repetitive, it left me completely untouched. But then God touched my spirit and worship came alive. It wasn't forced, it became a delight and it still is. Hallelujah. That's because God touches our hearts. The, transla- the, the, um, the Passion Translation puts the Romans 5 verse this way and this hope is not a disappointing fantasy because we can now experience the endless love of God cascading into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who lives in us church as we meet with the Lord as we meet together um, as we sing some of the songs that we were singing today I just hope we're opening up our hearts each time to allow the Holy Spirit to bring that love of God cascading into our hearts over and over and over again. Because as, he, as the love of God comes into our hearts, then we can release that love to those who are around about us through the Holy Spirit. One last main verse coming up. Jesus replied, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. That was the question he was asked. What's the greatest commandment? Jesus said, this is it. And second is equally important, love your neighbor as yourself. Isn't it interesting? Again, both love for God and love for each other are included in the same passage. And Jesus says, loving each other is just as important as loving God. In fact, it's an expression, as I said, of our love for God. Here we are from the the passage translation again. Jesus answered, love the Lord your God with every passion of your heart, with all the energy of your being, and with every thought that is within you. This is the great and supreme commandment, and the second is like it in importance. You must love your friends in the same way you love yourself. Wow. 
That's a high calling, yeah? The main expression of our love for God is wholehearted obedience. We want to follow. We want to imitate. We want to obey because we love. It's our worship. We want to reflect his glory, make him famous. We want to lay down our lives for him because we love. I think this... Oh, wrong one. What's happened, Jamie? That's it. Um, so so, so um, Romans 12 says this, I encourage you to surrender yourselves to God, to be his sacred living sacrifices and live in holiness, experiencing all that delights his heart. This becomes your genuine expression of worship. So we're here to reflect his love. You see, loving God with every passion of our heart, with all the energy, with all the being, means he's number one. Far above every other commitment or passion. His call on our lives is higher even than our wives' call, even than our bosses or our family. Our worship of him comes before the worship of our career or finances and making money or music and idols or fashion or football teams. Loving God means we choose to spend time with him in prayer, worship, in his word and with the people of God. It means as we gather together as church, we bring our overflow of worship and praise in our singing, in dancing, in applauding, in shouting. That's worship. That's love for God. And our lifestyle reflects his love. Our language, our attitudes, our home life, our work life. We may not want to share our faith, but loving God means, well, we will. We may really fancy that young man or that young girl, but actually he or she is not even on the agenda because she's not a Christian. And Jesus has my higher devotion. We were in Uganda a number of years back, and a young non-Christian guy joined our team, and uh, Pastor Fred thought he seemed like a nice guy, for Lisa, who was also there. So we, so we said to Lisa as we were walking through some jungly bush somewhere, he said, Lisa, Lisa um, this guy seems a nice guy. What do you think? He said, Pastor Fred, he's not even a Christian. Now, a few months later, he became a Christian, started dating Lisa. He's now my son-in-law. But Lisa was so right in that initial response. It was her expression of her love for Jesus. She didn't even want to think about romance with James because at that time of his life, he was not even saved. That's devotion, isn't it? That's, that's what God's calling us to. Our love is so much higher for him than anybody or anything else. And equally important, Jesus says, is our love for our friends. And again, if we're to love as we love ourselves, we need that revelation from God about us. He thinks we're okay. Actually, he thinks we're more than okay. He thinks we're great so great he wants us to be part of his family he adopts us he chooses us and not just to be a young member of the family but he makes us heirs to receive all that his rightful children would normally you know legally would receive now becomes our rights too as part of his family and we may think and some of us do well we just don't deserve that we're useless, we're rubbish, we're in a mess. And we can't love others when we think like that. But God doesn't see us that way. He thinks we're perfect. To him, we're the apple of his eye. To him, we were worth dying for. And when we begin to realize again his incredible love for us, not only does it enable us to worship him and love him, but also we can then begin to love each other too because we know how much we're loved and we can share that with others so we need to change our mind about ourselves and see ourselves through God's eyes so that we can hold our head up high and with confidence we can release his love to each other too amen and um, now I just want to get a little bit practical if I can I think that's the one I wanted um, just as we close, um, you know, a community of love loves God, loves people, loves everyone. 
In such a community, everyone's accepted. We look out for each other. We care. We're friendly. We have time. We don't judge. I almost want to put on our doors a rainbow sticker and say, you're welcome. Because I want everybody to know they're welcome in this place. And the LGBT community aren't sure that they are. And they probably think they're not. And they probably think they know what we believe. But I hope and pray there's no homophobic people here. We love people. Because God's called us to love people. And that's just one group that's illustrating there. But it could be all sorts of groups. You're welcome here in this place. Just as Jesus accepted us, we accept all who come to. And not at arm's length either but we draw them into our lives, just as Jesus has done for us. Coming to the pavilion can be a big deal for visitors, but because we love, we make it as easy as possible. Or we should be. We're looking for that new face. We're looking for that new person, or that little group are by themselves, or that family we've not seen before. And we don't just see them at the distance. We go and we talk to them and we introduce ourselves to them. And we ask who they are and we say who we are and we, and we, and we welcome them in this place. And I want to say, church, if you consider yourself a member of Life Spring, please come before 10 o'clock so you can actually talk to new people too as they come in before 10 o'clock usually. And when you've spoken to them, you can invite them to sit with you and you can introduce them to others. And why not take them back to your home for lunch as well? In fact, we want us to start another little rotor again so that every week, maybe up to a dozen lunches are being provided by people in the church. And we're just opening up our homes a little bit more and we're saying, today I've got two or three spare places. Um, so if you're interested, sign up at the Connect desk or tell your life group leader. But uh, we'd just like to have that available so that whenever people come and they haven't got anywhere else to go, well, there's a number of people who've opened up their homes on that week and they can come back for lunch too. We brought a young German student with us last week. She was with us nine years ago, came back. Um, she was expecting to see all the people there from nine years ago, but everything's changed. But maybe for 10 to 15 minutes, this young girl was just sitting by herself. No one talked to her. In fact, there were very few of her age here before the meeting started. And I found Amy and I said, Amy, would you have a chat? And Amy chatted and, uh, and befriended her. But there could be others which come each week, each month, and there's no one to talk to them. Can't we look out, church? Can't we be there a little bit earlier and come and say, this is family. It's not just a worship service we come to and disappear, but we're there to look out and to, and to give them a cup of coffee and to bring them up into the auditorium and to, to make them feel at home. Amen? So, so if you're up for that, as I say, well, we should all be doing that anyhow, and if you want to give meals as well, then that's even better. But so that's church on the bigger scale, but our life groups, they need to be communities of faith, hope, and love too. These little churches, which we were talking about the other day, they're our priority. And as I was talking to some life group leaders this week, you know, the importance of creating community and a family was be, I was, being, I was emphasizing because life groups must be seen to be so much more than a strategy or just a structure to win the lost. But they need to become a group motivated by their love for God, to make him known, yes, but to care really well for those within the group, um, to create loving, faith-filled, hope-filled, even fun-filled communities, which would be so much easier to bring our non-Christian friends to because it's not just a meeting but this is life, this is family together and there's love in the place so a few things there, we said a couple of weeks ago your life group's our church and in these churches we eat together we pray together, we share the word of God together, we motivate each other to share the gospel and invite others to join because of God's love and I'm just wondering now I've said to Jackie for a few months now whether we might just be starting some more mixed life groups um, just if that helps people come into the place and, uh, and they might find Sundays a bit overwhelming but couples could come into that sort of environment maybe we need to look at that um, I'm just thinking we need to eat more together um, certainly going back to the start going back to the New Testament church they had meals in their homes and they broke bread in their homes and they just 
But it seems such a shared life, so much more than our busy lifestyles allow us unless we become intentional to change. And so I'm just thinking we need to add food more into our life groups, uh, our gospel communities, um, so, so that we can express love and commitment over mealtime to each other and share more together, pray with each other, and also, of course, not losing that focus and we're longing to see our friends find the Lord. And so we'll invite them to come and have dinner with us too. In such an environment, I want to put it to you. As we look back to the start, the New Testament church, and let's add in a few miracles like they did in their time, maybe we will also be able to say, and each day, the Lord was adding to their number. Because we've created communities which are lacking so often out there in the world, but here is a community of faith, trusting God, believing God, regardless of circumstances, a community of hope, regardless of Brexit, they're believing God for the future, they're trusting God for the future, they're bringing hope because our hope doesn't rely on the European government or the British government, it relies on God and Jesus alone and he's the one that rules, he's the one that reigns and whatever the future we're going to trust him and we bring that hope into other people's lives and we love, we care, we share, we're hospitable, we spend our lives together. So, as I finish, back to the start, back to the great commandment, loving God and loving people. Back to the great commission, winning souls, making disciples, because he's worthy of it all. Amen. So I pray with God's, with the love of God in our hearts, we'll reach out to him more and worship him, and we'll reach out to each other more. For God so loved the world, he sent Jesus. And out of his love for the world, life spring, he's sending you too. Okay, here's a few questions for your life group discussion later this week. And we should have a worship team about to come up and, uh, and lead us in worship. But as they come, I would just like to pray. And if you're not in a life group, please sign up at the Connect desk and... Uh, we can help connect you into a life group where you too can discuss some of these things too. But Lord, let's stand together, shall we? Lord, I thank you that you've called us with a very simple, very simple calling on our lives to love you with everything we've got and to love people in the same way. And I want to ask, Lord, that as we look what it means to go back to the start, as we see how the church in those first days expressed that, Lord, I want to pray that you put something of that same spirit and desire and motivation in the hearts of everybody here, that we'll be prepared to go back to the start, to change what we need to change, so that we can love you wholeheartedly and we can love each other as you love us. Lord, touch us by your Holy Spirit, we pray, and fill us and enable us to be communities of faith, hope, and love. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We hope you enjoyed Sunday's message as much as we did. To find out more about Lifespring Church, head to www.lifespringchurch.org.uk.